This video will contain major spoilers for Fez. Fez is a game best experienced blind, so I recommend you either play the game or watch someone else play it before watching this video. Alright, now that we got rid of those losers, let's do a quick rundown. Fez is a game produced by the Polytron Corporation, released first on Xbox in 2012. It's best described as a puzzle platformer collectathon. In English, that translates to you jump around, solve puzzles, and progress is marked by picking up a large amount of collectibles. Fez's puzzle elements come from the ability to rotate the seemingly two-dimensional world around its y-axis, allowing the player to bridge gaps that would otherwise be uncrossable, change the orientation of platforms, and interact with other various rotatable objects in the world. This dimension bending ability is granted to the player character, Gomez, through the titular Fez, gifted to him at the beginning of the game by the Hexahedron, who is, um, basically just God. After giving Gomez the Fez, the Hexahedron explodes, scattering fragments of itself across Fez's lonely world, leaving it to Gomez to pick up the pieces. These pieces come in three forms, cube bits, cubes, and anti-cubes. Cubes can be assembled by collecting eight cube bits. Cubes and cube bits tend to require Gomez to complete a platforming challenge or a puzzle focused around rotating the world. Pretty much exactly what you would expect. The tutorial character, Dot, informs you that there are a total of 32 cubes to collect, and collecting all 32 cubes will restore the hexahedron. This isn't entirely true. Including anti-cubes, there are actually 64 cubes for Gomez to collect. Anti-cubes require a lot more thinking to obtain than regular cubes. These puzzles range from scanning an in-world QR code for a cheat code to spawn an anti-cube, to waiting a real-life week for a hand on a clock to align. Hey, you know that actually reminds me of something. Uh, wait. Ryan gets sidetracked? What? Alright, so I was planning on making a video, like, a year ago about how awesome Fez's anti-cubes are. They are not mentioned, explained, or even implied to exist until you find your first one. And the game transforms from a cute little puzzle platformer to an intense, cerebral game about, like, decrypting languages and solving some super intense puzzles. This part of the game is what makes it so memorable and cool for me. The realization that Fez is just much, much more complicated and interesting than it first appears, and none of its marketing even hints at it. It's just really cool. Okay, uh, now that that's over, uh, you only need a total of 32 cubes and anti-cubes to quote-unquote finish the game. You're granted what's aptly named the 32 cube ending when you do this. This ending is the main focus of this video, let's take a quick look at it. Oh, quick content warning for this ending, there's a mild amount of flashing lights and a lot of eye strain. So if you want to avoid that, or if you've already seen this ending, uh, go ahead and skip to the timestamp.
Okay, so, the music played in the background of this cutscene is called Continuum, written by Fez's composer, Rich Disasterpiece Vreeland. Vreeland cites the inspirations for the Fez soundtrack as impressionist composers such as Debussy and Ravel, while other modern composers like Stravinsky and Reich have, quote, always been an inspiration. Hang, hang on, hang on. What does modern music even mean? Well, in a nutshell, modern music came from a period of time in Western music history, starting roughly in the 1890s and ending somewhere around 1940. The most defining characteristic of modern music is the lack of tonality. I mean, whoa, hang on, what is tonality? Oh, oh, not this again. I have an older video that explains tonality, but it's like 15 minutes long and I'm not going to make you watch the whole thing in order to understand this like kind of side topic. Anyway, you've heard of the major scale, right? You know, good old do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Well, one of those notes, do, is much more stable than the others. If you end a melody on do, it usually sounds much, much more conclusive than if you end it on, oh, I don't know, T. Compare this melody that ends on do to this melody that ends on T. The first one sounded a lot more conclusive, right? Anyway, this note, do, is called the tonal center because of this property. Music that takes advantage of a tonal center like this is classified as tonal music. The modern era of music did not do this in a bunch of different ways, which I'm about to get into. Okay, this lack of tonality is pretty apparent in Fez's soundtrack. Like, listen to this. There is definitely not a tonal center there. However, Continuum is different. This piece of music is actually an arrangement of Frederick Chopin's Prelude in E Minor, Op. 28, No. 4. Frederick Chopin's Prelude in E Minor is one of his most heart-wrenching compositions. Written for solo piano, the piece is only a page long, but Chopin himself clearly thought it was one of his greatest works, as he requested it be performed at his funeral. The piece's tempo is largo, a marking that typically means very slow in music terms, but also translates to wide or broad in Italian. The melodic line is a slow chromatic descent. It evolves the feeling of something dying, as noted by the smorzando marking at the end of the piece, translating literally to, in a way that dies away. It is a hauntingly beautiful piece of music, and is present in a wide variety of media from many different times, including Fez. This piece was written significantly before the modern period, being finished in 1839. This period of time in Western music was known as the Romantic period. Music in this period is classified by being extremely expressive, with long form flowing melodies and gratuitous use of tempo rubato, which means shifting tempo to be more expressive. Despite citing his inspirations for the Fez soundtrack as modern composers, Vreeland clearly holds romanticism in high regard. Vreeland stated on his blog, quote, The lead designer had this idea to end for the game with Moonlight Sonata, but I decided to go with my man Chopin instead. Picking Chopin's piece was a deliberate decision on Vreeland's part, and definitely a good one, in my opinion. In Vreeland's arrangement, this respect for romanticism is pretty evident. Using synthesizer instead of piano opens up more avenues for expression, and Vreeland takes full advantage of them. He uses bit crush and downsampling to open up the piece at the beginning and constrict it at the end. He also makes use of stereo with the piece swirling between the left and right speaker. Impossibly fast synth arpeggios are played in the second half of the piece, outlining Chopin's chords and accentuating the intensity of that section. The soaring melodies and heavy tempo rubato are, of course, maintained from the original piece. Interestingly enough, the final two chords in Chopin's rendition are entirely omitted, cutting off the tremendous feeling of resolution provided by the final cadence. Just take a listen to this. I think leaving this out was an intentional decision, as the 32 cube ending is not the true ending of the game. The lack of resolution implies that there is still more to find and explore in the game. This choice of a romantic era piece is made even stronger by the themes of Fez. The plot of the game is an allegory for transcendence and enlightenment. The Fez granted to Gomez by the hexahedron is a physical gift of knowledge from a higher power. A higher power which speaks a language incomprehensible to Gomez. And the main obstacle Gomez encounters is an untamable force of nature, patches of inky night sky that destroy him if he contacts them. 
These ideas of enlightenment, a noble divinity, and the chaos of nature are all huge concepts present in Romantic era art, whether it be music, visual art, or literature. Continuum is a perfect representation and culmination of these romantic ideas presented in a video game. The instruments Vreeland use are evocative of retro games, and he uses them expressively to complement the emotion of a prestigious piece of music from the Romantic era. The use of a Romantic era piece references the themes present in the game, making it a perfect conclusion to a wonderful game.